Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to see a lot of people here today. Um, I'll give you some brief information. We are going to talk today about doing, doing, uh, doing business in Kazakhstan via joint ventures, consortium, and uh, AIFC. I will be speaking about joint ventures and consortium, and my colleague, Arujan Maimak, she will cover the AIFC side. I don't think that the whole webinar will take more than two hours. Um, I would like uh, to ask if you feel comfortable with it, maybe turn on your audio and turn on your video, because then I think we will pay more attention. And uh, for me, it is also will be more convenient because I will understand that I'm uh, actually, uh, we are doing this for uh, people. If you feel uncomfortable with it, um, then you might find it interesting from a um, business decisions perspective, like uh, uh, structure of the company, authorities of certain bodies, and AIC is uh, it. It might um, help you to. Uh, make a decision or at least to have an option uh, of uh, moving uh, or consider moving your business to AIFC platform. I think we will start now. Um, starting from the understanding of what is JV and what is consortium, I think uh, most of the people here do, uh, do know this. Joint venture is a legal entity. Uh, the main difference is that joint venture is a legal entity and consortium is just a contractual uh, relations between two companies. Consortium usually in our region, in Atro, in oil and gas sector, it is a pre-JV relations between the parties. It is also sometimes uh, a very quick, fast decision um, that is required by the subsoil users uh, when companies unite to show that uh, they are happy to unite their capabilities to get into a specific tender, into a specific bid. Joint venture is a solid legal entity, separate legal entity uh, that is created for ongoing uh, business, for unlimited usually ongoing business. When joint venture is required, it is usually uh, when uh, local content uh, is um, preferable for the for the clients for the subsoil users or when two partners decide to again combine their capabilities to um, and, and work together as a legal entity uh, by the way if you if you have any questions just uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, and ask your question we will go uh, with joint ventures. We will go through the creation of joint venture, its structure, decision making, and I think this is the the most important part: the decision making joint venture, and then its income and uh, uh, income distribution. With the consortium, uh, the creation, then its provision, management, and uh, human resources of the consortium, and then expenses and income of the consortium. There are uh, several ways of creating a joint venture. Uh, very simple and straightforward is uh, creating a new LLP, but also there is a, a, an aisle, uh, alienation of shares in the existing company. Um, in the presentation, we've listed the documents. If you, uh, I will not go through uh, every uh, document and through the process of every document, but if you need to know uh, uh, the checklist, just take a picture or let me know after the seminar, I will forward it to you. Uh, what is important to mention when you're creating joint venture via new LOP is that new LOP, this new joint venture will not uh, will not have the licenses or other assets, some assets that are untransferable, for example, uh, from, from the shareholders. 
uh, if you have the license for a specific activity and you are creating a new joint venture with your partner, your license will not go automatically uh, to this joint venture. This joint venture will be uh, a baby company that is just created and uh, the licenses must be obtained separately. And sometimes some certain licenses uh, obtainment would might take several months, which can uh, maybe won't go um, with your plans uh, or also some licenses are impossible to obtain if you're creating a, a new LLP, for example construction licenses design licenses you cannot get them if you just created uh, a limited liability company uh, for this uh, for, for these cases uh, you have an option of alienation um buying off the shares in a company that does have uh, the license required uh, it is also uh, um, preferable for the companies who for example they they uh, the shareholders that are planning to apply for a tender for a bid and uh, um, this bid have requirements that the company should be on the market for at least 10 years, let's say. Uh, and in this case, you cannot create a company, even if you have a history of uh, 100 years in, in your company, you cannot, um, this experience will not go on new joint ventures. So for this reason, you need to uh, buy shares in the um, existing company. We obviously suggest when buying shares, uh, we check, inspect the company, tax and uh, civil and criminal history. You can conduct a due diligence of this company. Then we also recommend to prescribe in your shareholders agreements, in your uh, sale and purchase agreements, uh, and then in the charter of the buying company, uh, like re-sign them uh, and uh, make sure that they correspond to the requirements of law and moreover the interests of, of the parties. Uh, for example, uh, there is an option by law when you can gift your shares to, to a third party and uh, in this case gifting the shares you don't need the consent of uh, your partner shareholder. For example, if you are uh, buying all the shares in the existing company and then um, this uh, shareholder who is selling you the shares, he remains there as your local partner for 50%. At some point, this local partner can get his shares without letting you know. And uh, it happens quite often uh, in, in our um, practice that companies do that and you cannot restricted unless this is provided by your uh, charter or by your shareholders agreement so for these cases we uh, strongly recommend to when you're buying all the shares in the company or when you're creating a new company make sure that uh, your charter and your shareholders agreement drafted in your interest too There are also options of uh, mergers and acquisitions. I would be more, um, I will give more details on this. Uh, this is, in most cases, this, this um, option is preferable uh, when you need a company with the history or you need a company with the license. Uh, let's say you need a, design license of uh, first category to get into the tender then uh, you don't have uh, obviously for example you're a foreign company you don't have this uh, this company in place then you can uh, find a company who has the uh, this first category li license and buy off uh, let's say 100 percent of of the shares and then uh, divide it with, with your partner to create this joint venture. So when you're buying off um, the shares uh, in this uh, joint venture, and for example, um, you are now just, just the shareholder of this company, and this company has the license. Uh, you can access, um, um, merge these two companies into one company, 
or you can acquire this company. So then you will hold the licenses of these companies. Uh, you will hold your own experience, the licenses, for example, you can move the staff. It will be one company having all assets and capabilities of, of two companies. This process doesn't take uh, that long. I would say from two to maybe four, six months, depending on, on, on the situation. But uh, we have done it several times in our practice, and this is a very, um, this is very valuable, um, I think, and uh, profitable uh, was for uh, our clients. We had a specific situation when one company, the LLP, they had a master contract with uh, the subsoil dealer with the client, and then they needed a license they don't have, and they cannot apply for this license because license of first category is granted only to the companies who are on the market for more than 10 years and have specific experience in the, uh, in the, in the design and construction, and they didn't have it. So we found them a company uh, who was, uh, it was a company that was empty and they were selling it just because of this asset uh, as in, um, in license. Uh, our clients bought shares in this, in this company, but they didn't need two companies, two LLPs. Uh, and the contract was with the first company, with, the, uh, with our client. So we uh, made this, um accession then the company we bought uh granted its licenses to the company with the master contract in the end we had one company one business id number with the uh, licenses required with staff with master contract uh with subsoil user I'll go briefly through the JV structure. I think everybody is aware of it, but um, maybe sub supervisory body is something that not everybody, every uh, company uses in Kazakhstan. So we have Supreme Governing Body, which is a general meeting of the shareholders. Then we have Supervisory Body, the Audit Commission, or uh, a council, Supervisory Council. And then the Executive Body, the General Director, or the Board of Directors, who do, does the operation. Operational business. So, Supreme Body um, has a list of uh, exclusive authorities provided by the law, and uh, this exclusive authorities is something um, something the business struggle with because this exclusive authorities cannot be shortened but can be expanded, and uh, shareholders, in fact, they uh, they they get involved into the operational business because they cannot avoid uh, the, the list of exclusive authorities is quite long. Also, uh, what is um, what this business struggling with is that uh, Supreme Body allowed to cancel any decision of the general director and the supervisory council. It also can limit powers of other bodies, including general director and the uh, supervisory, supervisory uh, council. Well, um, I think everybody knows that general meeting gather at least once a year. Uh, it can be gathered quarterly, um, like annually, once and a half a year. Important to mention that organization of the general meeting is strict, strict, strictly uh, regulated by law. Uh, I mean that it's strictly regulated by law. I mean, it's very bureaucrat bureaucratically regulated. It's like you, must inform the shareholders like one month in advance. They should be this form of notification. Uh, it's like, it, it, I think it's giving too much pressure on the general director. It's too, too uh, many requirements, especially if your uh, LLP um, is not uh, big, large, I mean like, like 5,000 people or something. Um, it's all provided by default. And you cannot avoid it unless you prescribe it in your charter and uh, shareholders uh, in your charter, mainly. So this is what we also highly recommend uh, to lighten the process of general meeting gathering in your charter. Then it will ease the process. And uh, for example, if you, in case of conflict with your shareholder, 
they can use it against you. For example, if the meeting was gathered incorrectly, they didn't notice you, or, or you did, or, or general director didn't notice them uh, in a timely, like in, in a manner that is prescribed by the law. Then they can challenge it through the courts, and they can uh, make mm, troubles. So we highly recommend to um, check your charters after this uh, seminar and make sure that uh, it really it, it's not just the charter signed up. 10 years ago, uh, it really lightens and eases the process for of uh, operation of, of like corporate operation of, um, of your company. Supervisory Council. Supervisory Council is a middle, middle body between uh, the shareholders and the general director. Um, Obviously, it supervises the activity of the executive body. It is very useful uh, when you have an existing actual joint venture between two legal entities, and you appoint from each side, you appoint one person to make sure that the general director, at least for first, I don't know, five years, general director uh, does what, uh, what you as a shareholder want him to do because general director is obviously a person from one side of the shareholders or a third party that is hired by uh, both of the shareholders. Um, what is important here? Sometimes some clients um, creating the supervisory council uh, for the migration um, like, you know, because uh, you don't need a work permit and you don't need a labor contract and therefore salary for the supervisory council. And if you have a general director and you want to make sure that, uh, or, or you need a person to just audit the general director or supervise it or inspect it or uh, for, for some period of time, you can send the person in. You don't need to pay uh, this person in Kazakhstan, therefore you don't need to tax like pay payroll taxes in Kazakhstan. You also don't need uh, a work permit in Kazakhstan, which is, um, I think, a good option. Uh, if you do create the supervisory uh, council in your company, please make sure that you have uh, um, the rights and obligations and uh, the, the general legal regulation of the supervisory board in your charter or uh, in, a, in a separate policy. We usually draft the policies um, that prescribe what supervisory company does um, in, the comp uh, in, the, yes, in the company. Then it goes to the exec executive body. I think uh, everybody and uh, everyone here understand the function of the executive body, the general director. Uh, from uh, by law, it is can be also sole and collegial. Not many companies use collegial, uh, like the board of directors, but it, it is the, the option is provided by the law. Also, it is important that uh, to mention that you can have two general directors. You can have three general. Directors. For example, if you have a joint venture and uh, uh, each shareholder uh, wants its own person uh, on the executive body, you can have two general directors working back to back or working together simultaneously. Decision making. Mm, if you look through the law, the decision making in, uh, in companies when it's about uh, these uh, exclusive uh, competences, questions of the general meeting, it is straightforward. It is either majority, uh, uh, simple majority, qualified majority, and uh, unanimous decision making. And if you have 50 50 shareholding uh, and, it's, and, and you didn't prescribe anything else in your shareholders agreement or your charter, then most likely you get stuck uh, with the decision making because you cannot get into agreement with your partner. However, by law, 
you are allowed to uh, um, to have different decision making in, in your company. Um, yes, as I said, most of the decisions are made by simple majority, except for uh, uh, specific matters like reorganization or liquidation of the joint venture pledge, etc. This is what the law says that each participant of the JV when voting has the number of votes corresponding to its shares in the charter capital unless as well, uh, another procedure is prescribed by the charter. If you prescribe by your charter in, uh, the, uh, in different process, then uh, you can break the deadlocks that, that are created by the standard uh, charters and standard shareholders agreements. I'll explain. Um, for example, you have uh, what are the, the main questions? I think, well, net profit distribution uh, is one of the questions that fall under general meeting competence. So if you have 50 50, uh, shares, therefore 50-50 votes, and one shareholder says we want to uh, distribute the, the income between the shareholders, the other party says that we don't want, we want to reinvest, you will never get into uh, a conclusion and this money will be like hanged uh, and, and uh, you will create a deadlock uh, between each other. So how can you break this deadlock. You can prescribe a vote that is not uh, corresponding your uh, shares. For example, if general meeting requires two thirds like qualified majority of total number of the votes, you can, for the company A, here's the example is green apple, green is company A and apple is company B. The company green, for example, would have five votes and company Apple would have two votes. Uh, vote. And regardless how the shares in their uh, in, in the charter capital provided, the vote of the green company will be decisive. And if they say, yes, we won't um, distribute the net income, or yes, we want to play, uh, pledge our assets, or yes, we won't reorganize the business, then uh, the, uh, the executive body will go through the procedure uh, through this procedure because uh, green company has five votes. Even um, if you if you see on the left side, even if uh, the shares in the charter capital less than fifty percent, you still can prescribe this in your um, charter and in your shareholders agreement. It is also important to note that every uh, question of the general meeting can be separately uh, uh, prescribed options, uh, the, the different number of votes. For example, uh, regarding appointment of general director, uh, you can give more votes to one shareholder than another and if it's regarding approval of annual financial uh, reports and distribution of net, net income, you can prescribe different uh, uh, voting. If it's a real joint venture between uh, two companies that both strong enough, you can take the list of, I think it's 18 uh, questions that fall under general meeting. And each question, uh, in each question, different shareholder will have a decisive vote. And I think that will uh, create more or less uh, good um, leverage for both uh, shareholders. Um, another option, um, we, we've talked about creating joint venture by setting up a new company. We've talked about creating joint venture by 
alienation of shares, buying the shares in a different company. And there is another option is a trust uh, trust management, how the um, how the business will be regulated uh, within the company. By trust management, um, you, for example, you have um, a shareholder, a nominal shareholder. You need a local content and you have a nominal uh, shareholder that holds 50% of your shares. You need it for, um, for whatever reasons. And, uh, but the decision-making uh, should be from your side and operations should be from your side. Then this local shareholder can sign trust management agreement with you and uh, give its shares, her shares, into trust management to you. So then uh, you are managing 100% of the shares and you can represent this local shareholder at the general meetings, which means that as a general meeting, you will be representing yourself and you will be representing the other shareholder via this trust management agreement. We uh, do have such uh, options uh, like uh, this structure in uh, with some of our clients and they find it uh, very um, comfortable. Uh, the only question here, I think, is, is a question of a, a business trust. You need to make sure that uh, this is uh, the local shareholder, the person uh, that will not cancel and terminate the trust management agreement uh, at, at the moment that is not comfortable uh, for you. The trust management can also be compensated and uh, not compensated is up to, to the parties. And distribution of uh, net income uh, within the JV, I think it is important to mention that uh, distribution is now can be made monthly, or not monthly, sorry, quarterly, uh, once in six months and once a year. And this distribution must be made according to the number of uh, share, shares in the charter capital. It is not strict, strict, strictly provided by law. I mean, you can make a decision at the general meeting that uh, net income is distributed, uh, for example, 80, 20, but uh, your shares is 50, 50, but then this can be challenged uh, in court. Uh, um, still, you can. It's not like you, you you are not allowed to distribute at all. You can distribute if both partners are happy with it. But then you need to be sure that the other side, the other party, will not challenge it further. And we move now to the consortium part. If you have any questions, I'm happy to reply them now. Just a second, I'm checking this. Um, no. Okay. Moving forward. As I mentioned earlier, consortium is a simple partnership. Uh, it is a, a, based on the agreement. It, it's just basically, it's a contract between two parties without creating a, a, a legal entity. Physical person can also be a part of the agreement to be called joint activity agreement. Um, usually consortium has a leader and this leader represents the consortium in the project in the time that this company is signing on behalf of the consortium, signing the contract uh, with your client. Um, I think the main advantage is that the consortium is not a legal entity, but at the same time, it can use, unite the capabilities, for example, licenses and human resources. Uh, if uh, one company has a license you require and you don't have it, and you both want to get into a tender, you can apply as a consortium, having you as a leader, but showing that you do have the license uh, that is required under the technical specification of the center. It also doesn't need a legal, legal address, which sometimes a question for, for, for some companies. The companies remain uh, independent uh, and also the agreement doesn't require any 
registration or notarization. Consortium, you can basically sign just a framework agreement, uh, then specifying all the details later on, but sometimes the question of apply for, for, for a specific volume of work, you need to create consortium, very urgent, and you can do it in one day by just signing this contract and showing uh, that you do have the consortium. And then later, if you are granted with this um, volume, you can prescribe who is responsible for what and how, how the consortium will be working from now on. It saves uh, a lot of time comparing to the joint venture because joint venture uh, will take at least one month to create. Uh, this is the consent. If you, if you need, you can take a picture. It is important to mention that uh, parties to the consortium are solidarily liable for the obligations related to the activities of the consortium. This goes. Uh, this rule goes by default uh, by law. You can change it in the contract. It is very important to change it if you don't. Uh, if you are not happy with the solidarity liability because the creditor uh, the client uh, if if he is not happy he can uh, demand the execution of the obligations from you and from your uh, partner of the consortium uh, at his own discretion he can do it uh, for example if your partner didn't execute they can demand it they can claim it uh, from you Well, consortium, as it's a contract and we do have the freedom of the contracts, you can uh, provide uh, the management of, of the consortium, uh, who is responsible for what in the contract. And you can do it as detailed as, as you want. Of course, we recommend to um, give maximum information in the contract. Otherwise, uh, you can create deadlock situations. But generally, consortium are um, very easy. They are straightforward and uh, um, they are uh, preferable. Some companies, they create consortiums as pre-JV and they work like one year on the consortium and then they move to the, while the JV is cre uh, uh, under the creation. Some companies, they prefer stay as a consortium for, for the whole period of time because each company wants to remain it, uh, independently uh, in a, on the market, in business, and uh, consortium, they, they are like the least pain uh, in, in, in this case. You can even leave all the management by one partner, for example, and take the second partner just for uh, some assets and capabilities like um, HR again, or licenses, or maybe other assets like uh, real estate production base, etc. You uh, from from the employment law, you don't need an additional labor agreement with the other party if you are having the consortium. Sometimes companies create a consortium even between their uh, their own companies. If they have several companies, one company have people, other company have licenses, other company have assets, they create a consortium, but uh, from, uh, from the HR point of view, you don't need to make uh, many labor contracts which, uh, with each party of the consortium, which just all stays under under one main uh, whoever was the employer of, of the first one. But if you employ additional people uh, for for the consortium, you can employ them for the for the period of of the consortium agreement. Uh, if consortium agreement is terminated, these people can be also terminated if it's prescribed in their uh, labor contracts.
and uh, finally income and expenses of the consortium. Uh, it can be shared the expenses and uh, they can be independent expense, expenses uh, or they can be shared expenses as you prescribe it by, by uh, the consortium both ways are, are workable. You can also expenses, you can also like the, the, the assets can be like the, the expenses. For example, you provide the human resources, the other party provide licenses, which means that you pay uh, for your people yourself 100%. You don't share uh, the salary payment and uh, your partner, for example, if he says that he's going to get the license, he uh, won't um, put these expenses on the consortium, for example, for uh, hiring an agency or a lawyer to get the uh, to obtain a license. Um, this is the final um, for the JVM consortium part. It's a termina termination of the JV and termination of the consortium. The consortium can be terminated um, as a uh, other civil agreement. Um, you just terminate the, the contract but uh, um, you need to write down the details how uh, what goes after the contract is terminated so then the parties are uh, fulfill their obligations in full um, termination of the jv can be it, well it's more difficult it can be um, made um, by alienation of shares again you can sell your shares or you can gift your shares uh, without letting know your partner if you need to then um, then uh, for example if you're gifting uh, if you're giving your shares uh, gifting or selling your shares uh, and you are exiting the joint venture by alienation of the shares you need to make sure that the company has been re-registered after that and uh, it, it, it's if it's in your interest to leave the company, make sure that you are responsible for this re-registration because if the other party won't do it, then your uh, exiting the company won't be completed. Because in a, in a state database, you will be still uh, reflected at the, at the shareholder. When you're creating uh, a, a joint venture, uh, from the beginning, you can prescribe options of, uh, of, its terminate, of termination by uh, selling the shares. And you can provide it uh, um, by signing up an obligation between your partners in the beginning that you will buy off the shares at the moment of, uh, um, I don't know, of giving the notice or if you decide so, or if, uh, uh, or when the project will be completed, you can link the, uh, this future alienation of the shares to a specific uh, situation um, or um, documents, or like, for example, as I said, like notice, it is, very comfortable and it's very uh, important for those who are planning to create JV or who are creating JV now because you will feel more safe if you know how you will move in a in a deadlock situations or when the uh, project will be over. I hope it, I hope I, I explained it clearly. The other option is a uh, liquidation. Liquidation is a uh, it, it, it is a it, it is a painful process. Uh, most of the time, it takes a while. It can take up to one year to liquidate the company. It requires the tax inspection. Tax inspection usually most of the time, ninety five percent of the time, they have findings. They have uh, violations, then they have um, the machine equipment. <laughs> they have yeah the additional taxes to pay, uh, there's the fine the penalties to pay. 
that is uh, that it takes a while and it's, it, it, it is uh, painful for the partners, especially when the business is already over. You just need to liquidate and you have extra expenses for this liquidation and for these penalties. In fact, they are enormous and they are um, the amounts are just crazy. Um, compulsory buyout of the shares. Well, if you are right now in a, in a joint venture, in a painful joint venture where you cannot get into agreement with your partner, compulsory buyout of the shares is one of the options when it's, for example, a significant harm inflicted to the to the joint venture for example you didn't get into uh, you didn't get some scope of work you couldn't apply for the tender because the um, the other shareholder didn't confirm it or the, the other shareholder didn't confirm didn't attend the general meeting where, where, when you were about to decide on this and then you there is a harm significant harm was uh, to the JV, then you can uh, initiate this process of compulsory buyout, although this, this goes through, through the courts and uh, it's also uh, it's a long-term long -term process, which doesn't have um, a lot of uh, common practice. I think the courts don't have that much practice on the compulsory buyout of shares. In, in astral, at least in our region. Well, I think that's it. I am done with the joint ventures and constructions. And I'd like to ask if anyone has questions. No, I think. If no questions, then we will move to um, Astana International Financial Center, and my colleague Arujan Aymar will continue. Thank you very much, Zahira. Thank you, dear colleagues, uh, for joining us today. So we are starting the second part of our presentation devoted to the IFC law. Let me shortly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Arujan Aymak. I'm a counsel at Grata International, working in the corporate and labor law matters for about seven years. And we have been also closely working with IFC law since, it's, uh, since 2018. So it also about, uh, it, so it has been about four years. And recently me and my colleagues have been certified as the IFC legal services provider. So today I would be glad to uh, shortly present you um, um, the IFC legal regime uh, and uh, share our experience in this field. So uh, to to start with, let me uh, say well, the agenda. So our presentation uh, will have the following. Uh, will cover the following issues. So first of all, what uh, what is the IFC? Why the companies should enter the IFC? So what benefits it gives to its participants? Uh, I will shortly talk talk about uh, legal regime in the IFC. Uh, just cover tax issues. However. I would like to mention that I'm not a tax lawyer, and if you have any specific tax questions, so we will be glad to address these questions to our tax team uh, in writing. Then I will uh, describe the process of the registration of the company in the AFC. We'll, we will talk about corporate governance, uh, about how the companies at AFC work. I will say something about 
practical aspects of working in the AFC, and we will um, cover radio missile issues, which is a very unique possibility for IFC companies. Uh, so what is IFC? First of all, IFC is a um, specific territory within the North Sultan city, uh, which, has, which has special legal regime in the financial sphere, uh, which applies to IFC participants. Uh, when IFC has been on list, has been established, there was it was some unclearance whether the companies incorporated incorporated in IFC should be considered as Kazakhstani legal entities or Kazakhstani residents. However, um, AFSA removed this doubt and it uh, issued a notice stating that all legal entities, companies, private public companies or partnerships should be considered as Kazakhstani residents and as Kazakhstani legal entities. Uh, the next one here, you can see the boundaries of the IFC. As you can see, this is the most part of the left bank of the North Sultan city. So if you uh, or your company uh, wishes to be established in the IFC and to be participant in the IFC, you must be sure that you have a legal address and office within this territory. So it's uh, uh, on the left uh, bank of, of the North Sultan city. Otherwise, you, uh, your registration will be rejected. So uh, why the companies should enter the IFC? Uh, the most uh, important part uh, which um, why the companies enter the IFC is, yeah, is that they, somebody, apologies. Uh, yeah, Mr. Merritt, do you ask him something? Okay. Yeah, so let me continue. So uh, tax benefits, um, mostly they are uh, applicable for those companies who render financial services, for example, for banks and for um, for banks and for uh, those companies who work with um, uh, as a, for example, as brokers uh, as and rendering services in, in the financial sphere. Uh, the second benefit is a flexible corporate regime. We will discuss about this later. So uh, actually, IFC corporate law gives more freedom to the company's shareholders than, for example, uh, LLP law, regular LLP law, but uh, it uh, increases responsibility of the company's shareholders. So all the details, uh, all the um, possible, um, the, all the matters on resolving corporate disputes should be uh, in detail um, described in the foundation agreements. So uh, I see Gaza best practice from other financial centers worldwide, such as Dubai International Financial Center or Qatar International Center. It has simplified legal regime for foreign employees. So when the IFC companies attract foreign employees, employees they do not need to obtain work permits which is mandatory required in the rest uh, of Kazakhstan. Then uh, IFC has simplified migration regime. So um, the foreign employees uh, may receive a work visa for much longer period than foreign employees working in the rest part of Kazakhstan. And the next one is the possibility to redemissile to another jurisdiction. So what is redemissile is the possibility of uh, for example, moving AFC company from uh, from AFC to another country, for example, to Cyprus, uh, without interrupting its business, without liquidation, uh, and etc. And vice versa, Cy company registered in Cyprus can be moved, can be transferred to AFC without liquidation. Uh, so let me describe the legal regime. Uh, AFC law consists of the following parts. So it consists of constitutional law of the Republic of Kazakhstan on Astana International Financial Center. Second one, it includes AFC acts, uh, which are adopted by AFC bodies and may be based on the principles, norms and precedents of the law of England and Wales and other financial centers. 
uh, please note that official language of the IFC Acts is English. So when interpreting, interpreting uh, the IFC Acts, we should rely only on English version of these Acts. And the other issues which are not covered by IFC Acts or by constitutional law are governed by the law enforced of the Republic of Kazakhstan. For example, issues on criminal cases, criminal relations and administrative violations rule are governed by uh, national legislation of Kazakhstan. Uh, here you can see I, the main IFC bodies. Uh, so uh, the first one is IFC Management Council, which is permanent body, uh, which defines strategic growth areas for AFC. Uh, this management council is headed by the president of Kazakhstan and includes such members as the uh, prime minister, as uh, head of the national bank, as uh, vice prime minister, and etc. So it defines only big global strategic issues for AFC. The next one is IFC governor. Uh, currently is Mr. Kelimbetov. Uh, he is doing oversight of interaction among IFC bodies. Uh, the next one is IFC authority. Uh, it provides administrative support for IFC bodies. So it um, attracts um, some com companies or investors uh, to be participant of the IFC. Uh, the next one is uh, very important for IFC participants is Astana Financial Services Authority. It's a body uh, which uh, is a regulator, uh, which uh, registers the company as the IFC participants, which give licenses, which can withdraw these licenses, and uh, like it's a main regulator uh, for all the companies uh, incorporated in the IFC. The next two bodies are bodies uh, which resolve disputes uh, within the IFC is IFC court, which is uh, uh, the first uh, court, uh, which um, common law court, uh, which have uh, uh, judges uh, um, qualified under the law of England and Wales, and it's the first uh, court, such court in the Central Asia. And the next one is International Arbitration Center, where the parties can uh, choose ar arbit arbiters and uh, where, where they can resolve their own disputes. So all, all the IFC acts are adopted by the following bodies, which, is, uh, which I mentioned uh, now is IFC Management Council, IFC Governor, Governor IFC Authority, and APSA. Here you can see the description of the tax benefits. As you can see, it, the most are devoted for the financial uh, and supplementary services. So it's exemption from corporate income tax. It's exemption until 2066. Exemption from private e, uh, income tax also until 2066. Uh, and the rest benefits. So just describing it shortly as a tax lawyer. The next part, so how the companies can enter uh, to the IFC. So we can see there are three options which are registering uh, a new, new company. Uh, second one is recognition of the existing company. And third one is a transfer of incorporation. Uh, so at the first case, you're, um, you're choosing the company type, you're establishing, drafting the foundation documents, and uh, you're establishing a new legal entity. Uh, as a recognition, if you have, for example, a foreign company outside AFC in Kazakhstan, maybe, or um, abroad, so you can register this company, uh, recognize this company, and as a result of your uh, recognition, a new branch or representative office of such company is being registered in the AFC. And also if your company, foreign company, uh, also have a license um, for rendering financial services, APSA also, um, uh, also authorize this license and recognize it. So before registering the, before recognizing the company, you should recognize a license at first. And the second one is the third one is transfer into incorporation, or in other words, it's a redemption. Uh, also, as, as I mentioned, 
it's uh, when the company is being moved from another country. Yeah, the next slide here you can see just um, uh, some types of activities which need AFC license. It's not exhaustive list. All, all the whole list is indicated in uh, AFC general rules uh, in schedules two, three, and four. So uh, the whole type of activities are divided into three parts, which are regulated activities. Also, it's mainly like advising on investments, arranging deals and investments, accepting, providing deposits, providing credits. And um, so it's mostly a banking license, like banking activity licenses. The next group is market activities, when, the, uh, when you're operating an exchange when you're operating crowdfunding platform. And the third part is for provision of the additional services such as legal services. For example, Grad currently is um, recognized as pro and has a license for provision of the legal services in the AFC. The next one is providing auditing services, accountancy services, or other types of consulting services. For all these types of activities, before registration in the IFC, you must obtain a license. Please note that um, the license should be received before registration of the company. And uh, it's quite time consuming process. Uh, obtaining the regulated or market activities license may last about nine months or up to one year. So it should be noted when you uh, wish to enter the AFC. Here you can see the main types of legal entities at AFC. Uh, so they are divided into two types, um, commercial company, not special companies and non-commercial companies. There are also some specific uh, types of companies uh, which uh, can be established for performance specific activities, but I'm not covering here today. Here we're just uh, considering not special companies. And as you can see, commercial ones are private company, public company, and the partnership. So general partnership, limited partnership, or limited liability partnership. Also, when the company is being recognized, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, that that company is called as a recognized company, or in other words, it's branch or representative office of the foreign company. So here is a table describing the, the main differences of the types of companies. Uh, the most popular type of company is a private company, like uh, it has 80% of all the companies registered in AFC are incorporated in the form of private companies. Uh, private company is like uh, the best alternative or maybe for, uh, Kazakhstan does not have this type of company now, but if previously there was a closed uh, joint stock company, uh, so the private company, uh, the private company may issue shares, uh, but it cannot uh, make offer its shares on the public. So um, it, it like closed joint stock company. Uh, it, ha it may have a minimum one shareholder, which is can be a natural person or body corporate. Uh, the liability of the shareholders is limited to the amount that remains unpaid on the shares Company must have articles of association. It has. It must have minimum one director and minimum one chief executive officer. So actually, one person can hold two positions: director and CEO. There are no minimum share capital requirements, but from the technical reasons, uh, at least one USD should be indicated as a share capital of the private company. And as I said before, it may not offer its securities and shares to the public. The second type is the public company. The main difference is that it uh, may make an offer of its shares to the public. Uh, the minimum share capital for the public company must be um, is 100 USD. It also must have, uh, besides director, it also must have one secretary. And the liability of shareholders is also limited to the amount which remains unpaid on shares. 
So, and the next three types is uh, our general partnership, uh, limited partnership, and li limited liability partnership. General partnership uh, must have um, mandatory have two partners who uh, bears who bear liability in full by its own property. Limited partnership must have at least one general partner who is fully liable for the activity for the activity of the partnership and one limited partner whose liability is limited to the amount of contribution made to the partnership. And the third part, uh, third types of partnership is limited liability partnership, which must at least have two limited partnership, partnership partners, uh, which uh, liability is also limited to the amount to, made uh, to the partnership. Uh, here, uh, I would like to describe the main aspects of registration of an entity in AFC. So if you decide, if your company decides to uh, register the company in the AFC, first you should define what the company will do. So it is necessary because uh, in, this, in this stage, you should define whether your activity will be licensed or not. Um, also, the next step, uh, if you at the next step, you should choose a type of an entity, so whether it will be company or private or public or partnership. Then you should go through the authorization process. Authorization is the process of obtaining license. Uh, so it's a quite long procedure. Uh, then you, after, when you get the in principle approval that you will receive a license, you can proceed with preparation of the articles of association and prepare, prepare a standard article. You can prepare a standard articles, which is also already developed in the AFC, or you can draft on the bespoke article. Uh, if you are going to be registered in a partnership, you should draft partnership agreements. Then you should choose director C1 and who will be the secretary of the company you should always disclose all your ultimate beneficial owners before, because IFC always uh, in detail ask this information. Then you should pay a registration fee and you may proceed with the, uh, with the registration. Uh, here are the main corporate governance issues. And I will take an example of a private company. So there is a body such as general meeting of shareholders, or it can be one sole shareholder. Uh, the second the second stage of the bodies is uh, board of directors, if there are several persons or sole directors. The next required mandatory position is chief executive officer, who can be also a director. And the next one is a secretary. A secretary uh, is person responsible for gathering, for convening the general meetings, for signing the units, and et cetera. Secretary, as I said, is not mandatory at the private company and is mandatory at the public company. Um, I would like you to know that um, if, for example, Kazakhstan LLP law defines a specific list which uh, falls under the competence of each body, then the company regulation does not have such uh, strict rules. And you when incorporating a company, you should define what issues will fall under the competence of the shareholder, what issues the directors um, should decide, what is considered under the competence of CEO, et cetera. Otherwise, it can't be unclear uh, when, for example, uh, making some resolution on, for example, for attracting a finance, uh, uh, financing, attracting a loan. Sometimes it's not clear who should take a decision on such attraction. And for the avoidance uh, on decreasing the, any disputes, we, um, in our practice, we prepare the resolutions at the all the levels of the companies. It's not convenient. And in order to avoid such unclearance, uh, such situation, we recommend uh, defining in your articles of association a strict uh, list of issues, issues which fall under the competence of each body. 
uh, as I said before, the corporate governance uh, is um, gives more is a more flexible in the IHC rather than in the rest part of Kazakhstan. For example, there is no uh, dependence drop dependence of the number of shares uh, which shareholder have to the number of dividends or number of votes. Uh, to which they are entitled to. So there is no strong dependence, no correspondence. Uh, you, have, you, for example, shareholder may have two shares, but receive 90% of dividends or have 90% of voting rights when taking the decisions. Uh, so it's uh, big advantages uh, from the perspective of the corporate law. Uh, companies have a freedom to create different stock classes. For example, they can create classes which have provide a voting rights to the shareholder or class, uh, classes of shares which um, give does not provide the voting rights but provides a, a right to receive profit, for example. Or just you have issues shares which does not provide any voting rights or any rights to receive a dividend. So there is. Uh, total freedom in, such, in, in that respect. Also, shareholder can conclude any voting agreements, any agreements that will state that shareholder can vote in a certain manner as the shareholder will describe in the agreement. Practical aspects, as I said before, yes, uh, mandatory CEO required, but even uh, this, this is not a legal requirement, this is uh, only practical uh, requirement. Also, uh, despite the company's regulations state that no minimum share capital required from the practical perspective, since databases does not uh, allow indicating zero as a share capital, minimum one single or one USD dollar should be indicated in, as a share capital. So you should clearly divide the competences of the each body of the company and uh, there are some practical issues with liquidation of the company. Says, since IFC is quite new regime, um, there, there was one or two cases with liquidation of the companies because uh, there was, so when, if you decide to liquidate the company, you should first, um, uh, we recommend defining a, a step plan and agreeing this step plan with registrar and with li liquidators uh, because there is no well-developed practice in this respect. And also you can uh, make your waivers and modification requests if necessary. Mm, yes, what is waivers and modifications? Um, there is also such unique um, possibility. For example, if you as an AFC participant, as a company, understand that you are not able to uh, comply with some requirement of the IFC law, of the IFC Act, you can make a request on waiver or modification of this provision in respect uh, of in respect of uh, yourself. For example, um, in our case, we, sub we submitted such notification for our client. He was not able to provide accounts and reports uh, timely. And he described why it could, could not do it because um, so we sh you should provide the specific reasons why you are not able to comply with this provision. And registrar of companies, uh, if at its own discretion, if he uh, considers such reason as uh, such, uh, for example, a reasoning as uh, justified, as a registrar may issue that, okay, this provision of the IFC law does not apply to you, or it can modify, amend this provision in respect of the specific company. So it, it can be uh, undefinite. I, I mean, like uh, for, it can be restricted by some, uh, restricted by some period or registrar can give specific conditions, but, uh, AFC participant has some possi such possibility, which is quite unique um, and in regular Kazakhstani law, we do not have such uh, such possibility. But 
not of not in respect of all IFC companies or all IFC acts, uh, the companies may receive such waivers and modifications. Uh, you should analyze uh, on the case by case basis on this issue. Uh, reports. So all the companies registered in AFC, they should submit annual accounts. Uh, if they um, annual accounts, annual returns, annual confirmation statements. Um, in the specific cases, for example, in, if, in case their return is more than 5 million USD. Uh, here's the procedure of the redemissile. As I said, uh, transfer of incorporation from another jurisdiction. So there is uh, a list of jurisdiction when uh, such incorporation can be made, um, not from all the countries. For example, uh, I know that we know that all the state-owned uh, subsidiaries, many state-owned subsidiaries are incorporated in Netherlands. Please know that it's not possible to transfer, to move the company from the Netherlands to the IFC because uh, the law of ne Netherlands does not allow this. So there are restricted, uh, restricted uh, exhaustive list of countries which allows the domicile uh, or transfer of incorporation of their companies into the AFC and, there are, and which can accept uh, AFC companies to their own jurisdiction. Um, and the next, uh, for example, it's not possible to redemissile uh, IFC company into the rest part of Kazakhstan, for example, uh, to move it and to make that it will be registered as a LLP, uh, as a regular LLP in Kazakhstan. Uh, because Kazakhstani national legislation does not allow such entrance and uh, um, such a domicile of their companies. What we can do, we can do, um, if you, for example, if you want your LLP to be um, registered in the IFC, so you can apply uh, to, you can apply to court and ask for IFC court to make an order on amalgamation of this LLP with a private company already established in the AFC. So we have a practice of such amalgamation and if you have, if you have specific questions, we can uh, share our practice with that. So there is a possibility also to do that, not uh, by the transfer of incorporation, but through a separate order of the AFC court. This is also a great uh, possibility. Yes, uh, if so how, how glad I can help you, we, are, we, are, we will be happy to advise you on any issues concerning the AFC law. And so if you have any questions, please ask or write us on our contact details. And we will be happy to share our experience and help you with AFC legal matters. That's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. In the chat. No. So, uh, may I know the procedure involved for the short term projects like uh, two, three years? Can you repeat your question? Sorry. For the short term projects like two years or three years, the, yes. the personal mobilization uh, like uh, hundreds or 150, the short term visa other formalities, establishment of the company for the oil and gas, power and uh, sector. What is the procedure? May I know that? What is the procedure? What is the pr pr procedure of uh, attracting, pouring labor to the oil and gas project? This is what you mean? 
correct also for the establishment of the company is required or any what is the arrangement which needs to be done are you considering registering via astana financial center or are you considering register in astro registering in astro astro do you have a partner or you want to register it as a physical person or as a legal uh, foreign legal entity we don't have a partner you don't have a partner do you have a company abroad yeah of course okay so you want to register a company in Israel for oil and gas project you have a specific project already you are planning to go into and you will be involving foreign labor force did i get you correct correct uh, very easy i will send you the list of the documents it, it was list, listed just just now, it's a it's a very easy process. When you will be attracting foreign lab labor, you will need to we will need to understand what terms they are they will be working under, how long they will be staying in, in Kazakhstan, uh, what category of uh, employees they are. For example, if they are just engineers, it, uh, the processes uh, might be. Um, more complex rather than if they are managers um, and uh, supervisors. Also, uh, it is important, there is a local consent requirement for uh, attracting the foreign labor, which means that if you um, attract foreign labor, you must, um, you must also hire local specialists and uh, it goes as 70 to 30 or 90 to 10. 70 and 90, it's, it's locals, and uh, 30 and 10, is, it's uh, foreign. Um, we, we can consult you on this uh, separately. It's a, it's a standard process. And also for the work permit obtainment, we can um, recommend you an agency who, who are practicing it on a daily basis. OK, thank you. Yes, can you please, uh, because I don't, I can't see your name here can you please uh, just text something in the chat so then i can i can have your sure sure okay. i will drop you a separate email on the lovely. address given yes great lovely thank you we are happy to reply other questions if anyone has it I can. Uh, hello. Can you ask a uh, reply, please? If we want to start the process to incorporate into the AIFC, uh, whom directly, maybe you can provide us the contact information, whom directly from this organization we can uh, ask or request them. I can give you contacts if you want to contact the AIFC. No yeah, please. Thank you very much. It will be very helpful. But keep in mind, if, if, you have, if your project is a natural, then it's natural. If your project um, is a natural and you want to work via AIFC, uh, there is a region on, on the, in the city where your company must be registered. So it must be in the territory that AIFC covers. Atrao is, is 3,000 kilometers from this territory. Just yeah, okay, I see there are a lot of details. That's why we want to discuss them directly to, because so many questions just appeared in this. You, of course, the presentation is <laughs> helpful, but it doesn't cover all the details of our company. Sure, no problem. We can make a separate poll next week. Uh, if, if you list us the questions, we will reply your questions. And if you need additional poll, uh, myself, Arujan, and you, we can sit down and discuss them via the poll. Yeah, okay, please uh, send me details of the uh, representative person, maybe from the AIFC. And if we have any more questions, we'll direct, okay? Sure, we'll be waiting for your email, right? So then we can reply. Yeah, sure, I will, uh, thank you. Well, if not, I think 
it's time to say goodbye. We want to thank you, thank everyone for sharing um, this, this time with us. And if you have any questions in the future, feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.